Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1970. We're going to be taking a look at Chicago and they're going to be playing through Make Me Smile. And we've got Terry Kath on lead guitar and rhythm guitar here at the front of stage. So let's see how Terry and the guys get on. I'm just going to jump in here while we break off into this instrumental section and this track is so progressive, especially in the way that it starts. Have a listen to the intro and watch the journey, listen to the journey, the way that we just weave our way to so many different places, but the dynamics that is involved in that intro, also the way that the horn section delivers it dynamically, it's almost like fading in, like you would do with your volume on your guitar, just having that expression in there and across the whole band you're always going to get a great live performance from Chicago with that horn section in there it adds something totally different dynamically to your standard rock band setup and also the luxury of having two or more vocalists and proficient vocalists at worst so that they can harmonize with each other. We have great vocalists in Chicago. I have done another video on Terry and focusing, of course, on his guitar playing, such a distinctive vibrato that he had. Also, the technical ability. We're going to get into his guitar solo in this performance as well, even though I think it has been edited ever so slightly to make it shorter, unfortunately. But the way that Terry plays so expressively on the guitar, and then had that voice as well. And I think if he'd been at the front of the stage, maybe, it sounds weird, but his guitar playing would have been under the spotlight as well, because it always tends to happen that if a guitar player, especially someone who can play a great lead solo and express through the instrument, if they sing as well, they're under the spotlight even more. Just think of Clapton and Hendrix and all those other players that sang. And Terry Kath, has a great voice, having that ability at both the instrument and vocally certainly 
Terry is one of those names that might have flown under the radar for a fantastic player, but also a fantastic vocalist. The elements that we have in Terry's voice, when he gets up towards the top of his register in chest voice belting it out, we get some of that grit in there as well. But also, he does flip into head voice here, so we get that real top register, but it's not weak, it's a really clean head tone that he can throw in there. So he's got those different departments of his voice totally under control. And that's something that you'd generally expect from a standalone singer in order to belt out in chest voice, but then flip over to that head voice sound if they want it. So Terry's voice really does take you by surprise in this performance because of the diversity that he had, the ability that he had, but the control that is obviously prevalent in the head voice, but also the chest voice. So we've got a great vocal from Terry here playing rhythm guitar at the same time. I always say it doubles the difficulty, but just letting that right hand go to really set him in that groove. We've got the classic horn section stabs here that you get with Chicago on the offbeat. They're always in there to keep you interested, but this track as a whole is so progressive in nature that there is always something that is gonna change just to make that journey more interesting and to keep your attention the whole time. And this was actually their first top 10 record that they had in 1970. And you could argue that it did bring Chicago back to the forefront in terms of making them more popular than they were. Just to give you a reference point as to how this track increased the popularity of previously released tracks by Chicago, initially questions 67 and 68, that got to number 71 in the charts, but after this song, it was re-released and it got to number 24 in the charts. And then another track called Beginnings, that failed to chart when it was first released, but after the success of this song, it then got to number seven in the charts. So Make Me Smile was a real injection of popularity for Chicago as a band. I wanna spend a bit of time on this video talking about Terry Kath because I looked at his playing in another video on this channel, but I wanna get into when he started playing and his influences because he listened to so many different players. He was influenced by The Ventures, Dick Dale, Eric Clapton, Mike Bloomfield, Jimi Hendrix. So there are a lot of players in there that obviously influenced his playing, but I think importantly, when he did start picking up the guitar and learning to play lead and rock and roll, he did start to have lessons, but then he gave up on that and was really self-taught from there on because he said that he wanted to learn those rock and roll chords. So it was obvious that the teacher, whoever he went to, didn't really appreciate Terry's creativity in making his own sound. And that's really what every teacher should do. Everybody's individual. So you just get them to pursue their own sound. But Terry already had that. He didn't need lessons because he had the creative drive to sound like himself. And he certainly achieved that. You've got a guy here who was exploring his own avenues, just jamming. And for me, that is such a great way to learn. And you can see Terry Kath is the result of that. Such a unique player with such great technical ability as well. When he was at home playing, his brother used to play drums and his mum used to play the banjo. So he was surrounded by music from a young age. And at age 17, he was in a band called The Mystics. And then age 19, he joined another band that is Jimmy Rice and The Gentleman. So Terry was learning on the job, getting out there, playing in front of people, and certainly playing and singing at the same time. It's one thing to do it in your bedroom, but then to be able to do it in front of lots of people, it is a skill that you just have to learn. And Terry was doing that from a young age, at age 17 and in his late teens. Also in that second band, Jerry Rice and the Gentleman, that's when he bumped into Danny Serafin on drums and also Walter Parazeda, who was the saxophonist. So he had that link in there quite early on. So at age 20, they set up a cover band called The Missing Links, and they used to rehearse in Walter's basement. Cetera joined in, and following his involvement with the band, they then signed to Columbia Records, 
and initially they were called Chicago Transit Authority, but then in mid-1969 they changed the band name to Chicago. I think also Terry was seen as the band leader. He always wrote at least one song on an album and always had a lead vocal on an album as well. So when you pair that up with being a lead guitarist and taking the spotlight in that sense, he was obviously a personality that would drive forward and get things done, but he had that musical ability in order to effectively take the reins of a song, not only write it, provide a vocal, but then also lay down a guitar solo that could melt your face, or he could get to express through that fretboard however he wanted to. But let's get back into the video and hear some of that expression. Like I said before, I think the solo has been cut off just at the end, but we'll check it out and see what what Terry gets up to. We have it. It is a shame that that guitar solo is cut short somewhat, but you can tell the technique that Terry has on the fretboard, starting off with alternate picking and playing some of those runs. The thing about Terry's playing is you get the impression that he's wrestling the guitar, but the guitar is no match for the power on the fretboard. Something that I want to bring your attention to as well, apart from the lead playing of Terry Kath, is his rhythm playing. And the way that when he is playing rhythm, he's never struggling and trying to get the spotlight for his playing because he knows how to play the guitar to benefit the rest of the band. And it is a team performance. He is all about the band as a whole and that overall sound because sometimes, actually too many times, you'll see a band and the lead guitarist is always trying to throw in a lead line in amongst the rhythm when you don't need it because the rhythm is to suit the whole band. That's the point of having instrumental sections is for the horns to then come in, play a little section. You might have a little drum solo that comes in to keep the interest. The last thing you want is a guitarist always trying to steal the limelight with a lead guitar line that's totally out of place when the rest of the band are taking the attention, taking your focus. That's the point of the journey. And Terry was a master at just sitting back with his rhythm playing, but then as soon as the spotlight was on him, he could really take that spotlight and totally take the song to another place with his lead guitar solos. When I say that Terry wrestled that guitar, he was a fan of lighter guitar strings. In fact, he used to string up his high E on his guitar with a tenor guitar string and then use the rest of the strings for 
the B, the G, the D, the A, and the E. And if you don't know what a tenor guitar is, it's just a guitar with four strings. You might have seen it before, but you might not have. It was initially designed for players of the tenor banjo, which only has four strings, to then move over to guitar. So it had that similar setup. But then it means that on Terry's guitar, the B string is the high E string, so it's gonna be thinner. So it means that he could manhandle those strings. This performance here by Terry, you do get a lot of that bottom end. And by the way, he also invested in Pig Nose Amps, the company. So he knew what he was doing with his amp setup and his guitar setup in order to get that tone with a lighter string. But covering his death, I'm gonna just mention about how he left us and how possibly avoidable it was as well because it was in 1978 and they just had a party at Don Johnson's house who was the roadie at the time for the band and it was Terry who was used to having guns around. He just liked firing off his guns. I think it's different here in the UK because guns are illegal. I've never held a gun, for example. I've never had contact with one. And I think here there's obviously that natural fear of having a gun is like holding death in your hand. So I don't wanna be anywhere near one just in case an accident does happen. But Terry was used to guns and he did have a lot of guns. He had his 38 revolver and he spun the barrel on it and it wasn't loaded and he held it to his head and he pulled the trigger. And Don said to him that, you know, you gotta be careful, but he said to Don that, look, it's not loaded, there's no problem. And then he got out his semi-automatic nine millimeter pistol and again did the same thing. He said that it wasn't loaded and he showed the empty magazine. But unfortunately, there was still one in the magazine that he put into the gun. It might have been after he showed the empty one to Dom. So he put that in the gun and put it to his head and pulled the trigger, not knowing that there was a round still in there and he died instantly. There are some people that I know have hinted towards it being a suicide, but from what I've read, with Terry being so open about his previous drug and alcohol abuse, I think it was just a really unfortunate accident that he didn't realize that there was a round left in that magazine. And it was just not really giving the guns as much respect as you should. And maybe he was a little bit blase about using guns and the destructive properties that if there is an accident, that is it, it is game over. But in 2016, Chicago were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which seems a little bit late to me, 2016, but at that event, Terry's daughter, Michelle, received that award on Terry's behalf. And by the way, Jimi Hendrix was a huge fan of Terry Cass playing. I did mention about Terry being influenced by Jimmy's playing in the 60s, but Apparently, Jimi Hendrix was watching Chicago and he said that that guitar player is better than me. And that sounds like something a guitar player would say if he was watching another band. I have heard other quotes and it's this typical quote that gets thrown out all the time that Eric Clapton was asked, how does it feel to be the best guitar player in the world? And then he says, I don't know, ask Jeff Beck. But you can put any names you want in those places. I've heard so many different versions of that saying, but Jimi Hendrix saying that the guitar player he's watching is better than him seems like a more believable quote, but we know that Jimi Hendrix was a fan because he did state that he was. But Terry Kath, a great all-round artist and one of those guys that was a triple threat, which is such a rare thing. He had the ability to lay down a lead vocal, was a great instrumentalist, but could also write write songs and those three things rarely come together in one person but we certainly had that with Terry Kath but thank you so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below let me know what you guys think and if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one Bro.